thank you very much for this opportunity. It's an honor. It's really an honor to me. Well, it's an honor to be alive and somebody interviewed you. <laughs> it doesn't happen much. So, reading, uh, being a B world as a researcher now for 20 years now, uh, part of your work to me, I have questions, uh, especially uh, for the coin of the word eusocial. Did they, did they mess up now with the evolution of the word from the original intent of that word? Because when I got the paper from 1960s, I think that they, there was a, an a evolution about how people use the word today. Is that true? Or you say messed up big time. Big time. My own professor messed up. Oh. That was Dr. Michener. Can you tell me this story? Yes, of course. <laughs> In fact, even I had given up on you, social. And so the story is, is there an interesting story? And I couldn't understand what happened. Because very early on, I started working on my PhD at the uh, University of Kansas in 1960, and I got my PhD in four years, I got it in 1964, and I defended my thesis in May 1964, at the same time my daughter was born. And um, so I was a working mother, and this is part of the problem of youth social, because back in those days, entomologists were basically men. It's not the way it is now when there are many female entomologists. But people just didn't seem to pay it, men didn't pay attention to the critical element of youth social, which is that the nests are, well, in the temperate zone, it's gotten more complicated now, but because more study has been done. But, uh, I was dealing with a kind of temperate zone of sweat bee, which are tiny little dark bees, and they lick sweat. Farmers know about them, but most people don't know about them. They're very small, but there are many, many species. And they're quite common in the temperate zone. And bumblebees are the same way. And they start their nests as solitary bees. The females, you see them in the spring. Let's say bumblebees, because people know about bumblebees. They're big enough for people to notice. And so if you go in early spring, and you'll see these big, big bumblebees, you know, the biggest ones, and those are the overwintered queens. From They mate in the fall, big bumblebees. They're the only ones that go through the winter. And in the group of insects, the hymenoptera, which are the ants, wasps, and bees, basically, uh, they, the females have a little pouch. It's called the spermatheca. It's in their abdomen, just a little pouch. So they mate in the fall, and they store the sperm. And only the mated queens go through the winter. And they they usually nest um, someplace cozy where they can find a place to escape the heavy frost. And so after in the early spring they come out and you'll see these big bumblebees bumbling around, around the, low to the ground. They're easy to see. And those are the overwintered queens complete with their sperm pockets and looking for a place to start a nest. And they are indeed single mothers, and they act like solitary bees. They have a solitary phase when they, in their life cycle. This is critical to the definition of you social. Everybody missed it. It was in my original definition. They were single working mothers. Single working mothers that need to do everything. Exactly. Just like human single working mothers. I and, mean, and that was their the husband was basically their spermatheca, but they made yeah. it in the fall. And, you know, the guys missed it. That was the original... Original definition. Definition. That was my definition of the word. And I coined the word because when I was doing my thesis, I thought... I was working on these little tiny helictine beans. And what I had done, of course, I had devised... Earlier, I was when I was doing my BA, I went to Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. And my, one of my professors was interested in ants. He, he was Neil Weber. And he was interested in ants. And he studied leafcutter ants. 
And I was really interested in studying ants, and they're a lot easier to study than bees because they don't get up and fly away when they get upset. And you, I, when I was a kid, I had ant farms. They were popular with kids. I don't know if they are now, but when I was a kid, I had an ant farm, and you could watch the ants running around doing their thing in their nests. And I had devised basically bee farms, and I was designed similar to an ant farm, but it had like a landing platform so the little kind of tiny bees I was studying could fly in and land and make their nests, and then I could watch them inside their nests, similar to an ant farm. So I could observe the bees in their nests, what they did, who was the queen, who was the worker, who was this and that, because these bees nest in the soil, unlike honeybees. They don't make honeycombs. You know, they're very different, and they have a very different social organization from honeybees. So they have queens that can do everything. When they start the nest, they're single working mothers. Queen honeybees, they can't survive without a swarm of workers. And the honeybee includes stingless bees too. They're closely related to apis. And by the way, I've collected almost all the species of apis because most of them occur in India. And I've gone to India often because my husband was from India. And so I've studied most, almost all the species of apis in the field. Yep. Nice. Yeah, people think I only do the um, pollen bees, but I also have studied more honey bees than most people. But I don't make a big deal about it because they're not as interesting as the 20,000 other species of bees. <laughs> I think I understand what you're saying, but some people at home, uh, you said something that I think it, 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 it'd be nice to be to have some explanation. The term pollen bee. Yes, I want to can everybody you, to learn about pollen bees. Yes, can you define pollen bees to people at home that doesn't know that? I, because I, I have an understanding. No, most it hasn't caught on yet, and I didn't coin it. And we, I went to a meeting, and this other scientist coined this term. And all of us scientists at the meeting, and we were quite a few people, had gotten together and discussed what do we call bees that are not pollen bees. And there were several words that are used for, for these other pollinators. Bees, bees that are not honey bees? Or... Bees that are not honey bees. Okay. So pollen bees is an alternate term. We have the word honey bee. Yes. Honey bee, honey bee, honey bee. Well, what do you call a bumblebee? It's not a honey bee. This here, honeybee is a name created by humans for the usefulness of this insect to people, for the honey. Well, what's the usefulness of the other 200,000 species? Right? Mm -hmm. For their pollination ability. Honeybees are not particularly good honey, not very good pollinators on a bee to bee basis. Uh, the thing about honeybees, they're slow. We have, we have to use lots and lots of honeybees to pollinate a crop. You know, each hive has something like 50,000 bees in it. And they put out a lot of hives. If you watch a honeybee, they're slow. They're clumsy. They were brought here to, to the Western world for the sake of their honey and wax. Pollination wasn't known about in those days. They were brought to produce honey and wax. That's why they're called honeybees. People didn't know about pollination in those days. Then, then. So pollen bees are the other bees. The other bees. That we use to pollinate crops. And this is a recent development. You know, previously, look, the Native Americans lived here. There were no honeybees. Their crops got pollinated because we had plenty of local pollinators. Just think about it. Yeah. You know? The whole Western Hemisphere, there were plenty of pollinators. Nobody ever thought before the 1600s things got pollinated. Who did it? Hmm? Now, the Apis mellifera was kept in Europe for honey and wax, and, and of course the Native Americans kept the um, stinkless bees for honey and wax. And those are closely related to honeybees, I mean, Apis, stingless bees. So those are honeybees. They're stingless honeybees. That's what they should be called, stingless honeybees. They make honey and wax, and the native people harvested that, and they raised the bees. Have you, you studied those, I understand. Yep. So those are a variety of honeybees. So the alternative to honeybees is pollen bees. It's the use people 
would make of the other 20,000 species of bees. All of the others, many genera. It's a huge amount of unused bee power out there, which they, we don't have a name for. They've been called like wild bees, they've been called native bees, and some other names. Non-apis bees, which is a horrible neg negative term and a mix of languages. Non-apis. Yeah. Uh -uh. I've discussed this in one of my papers, um, which I'll refer to when, when we have the meeting. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. It's not bee related, but at the same time it is. In the past, how was in the past to study entomology being a female? It was a struggle. I was a struggle. I was the eldest of four children. I was a family babysitter. Um, it was very difficult. I, one reason I don't like to use a computer, because it has a keyboard. Well, the jobs for women when I was growing up were you could be a nurse, you could, of course, be a housewife. That's mostly my sisters. They're all just regular housewives. When I graduated from high school, all my classmates wanted to be housewives. They got married. All right. Most of them didn't go to college. I graduated. I went to public school all my life. My parents offered me to go to a private school. I didn't want to go. You know, already, I, I, I don't know why I was so stubborn, but I was just stubborn. I was a tomboy. Early on, I noticed boys had more fun than girls. And I even cooked up a term for that. Which my my youngest um, brother-in-law lives here. We brought him over from India. Well, that's my husband's youngest brother. He lives in Georgia, of all places. He survived. He came over here. He's very smart. He's a virologist. And he set up his own lab. And he, I, he's still alive, so I talked to him. We talk about India and so forth. And so, but... No, I was very stubborn, very smart, and I was the official babysitter for my family, so I was the eldest of four. And, and of course, my mother wanted me to be a lady, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. My father took me to a shrink when I was little. We moved to the Washington area during World War II. When my dad got a job at the State Department, there were a lot of job openings, of course, because most young men went to war. And I got, came across some old letters of my dad's to his mother, and and uh, he had taken me to a shrink. And people didn't just do that routinely back in those days. So this was before World War II. And they, my dad, I was just I was the guinea pig of the family because I was the first child of hit of my da dad, dad, mom and dad, and I was the first grandchild. And I was a girl who didn't really want to be girlish. I wanted to just have fun in life. And I was sort of outdoorsy kid and tomboy from a little age. And I suppose I didn't care much about playing with dolls, but bugs moved and they were more interesting. I mean, dolls didn't do anything. You know? And I was five years older than my next sibling, which was my sister. And she was ladylike. And my youngest sister is 16 years younger than me. She would turn out to be a lady. And my one brother, he was sort of sissy. You know, he didn't like outdoor sports. Uh, nobody liked bugs, but they all thought I was sort of funny. I guess I was. I mean, for a girl in those days. And I just noticed boys had more fun, you know. And so I determined, you know, not only I wanted to have fun like the boys did, but I did boy sports, like hunting and fishing and rummaging around in the wood, in the woods, catching bugs and raising bugs. I mean, I got my sex instruction from praying mantids. I used to raise those. And I think you may know what they do if you're an entomologist. So that was my sex ed. And so my husband was lucky I didn't chew his head off. <laughs> he didn't know much about praying mantids because he grew up in India. But anyway, he told me other things like how to ride a camel or an elephant. And, you know, I just loved it, you know. I just like to do things. And so then later on, as I got older, I got determined I'm going to beat the boys at their game, and I did. I have a fun story to tell you. Yeah? Twelve years ago Yeah. was the first time that I met you at the Beltsville in Maryland. Yeah. And it was the first time that I taste bear that you hunt. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. did. Were you one of the ones who wanted seconds? 
I, I, it was the first so time. And, and so you must have been at our at our picnic here in July. Yes, was yes. It? Yeah, with the neighbors. I, I was there. Oh, you were there. Did yes. you like it? I like it, and I was thinking, wow, I never saw uh, you know a woman hunting. That was the first time that I was exposed to that. Oh, good for you. Well, that was good. It is good. Yeah. Well, I brought some venison back with me. And that's when I start to to look at you and go off to your career and... Oh, I didn't know the bear went that far. <laughs> the bear start the whole thing. Oh, well, here's a bear skin right here. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> well, it's really funny because people people came, you know, said, is that really, is that real, you know? And some people liked it, and of course the vegetarians would say, hey, <laughs> well, I have some venison. I brought some back with me because I have a good friend, Beth Norton. She used to be my student, and now she's my friend. She's a co-author on some of my papers. She's an excellent bee scientist. So when I go, she takes care of my bee shed here. I mean, and my plants too, when I go away. But she's taking care of her 96 year old World War II veteran father. And he went and liberated Dachau in Germany, the concentration camp. And I went there, I've seen two horrors. See, I remember World War II. I was born in 37. And I was a kid in World War II. We had moved to the Washington area because my dad worked at the State Department then. I think I told you he worked for Harry Truman, did I? No. I oh, he worked his way up and became press secretary to Harry Truman. Yeah. Now that's a president we need again. We don't need this rubbish. I'm telling you straight. I liked Harry Truman. He was he was he was okay. And I used to swim, by the way, to get off the topic of bees, but. I used to go swimming in Roosevelt's swimming pool. You know, he had polio, installed yes. a swimming pool in the White House. So in the 50s, Dad was in the White House. I used to tip, go to art, I like art too. I saw my pictures right here. And so I used to go to the Corcoran Gallery across from the White House on Saturdays. This is how girls, on my mom, there was no helicopter parents back then. My mom used to say, go Susie, go out and play. Well, up there in the Adirondacks, I used to go out in the woods and go fishing in brook trout. It was a trout stream right in the woods. It's about a mile below our house in the woods. Go all by myself and uh, go fishing, catch some fresh trout, come home for dinner. She said, just go, just come home for dinner. And one time I was fishing and I stepped over a log and stepped right into a yellow jacket nest. And they got up my blue jeans and I dropped everything and ran home. I got sick, you know, vomiting and everything. You learn. I mean, you, mm, yep. you know, you learn. You learn hardware. I just dropped everything and went home. I got pretty sick. But anyway, I mean, you have to live and learn. You don't go around looking at a computer screen or GPS. I never had G. I had a map and compass. I go deer hunting, you know. You take a map and compass and your brain and you learn how to navigate the woods. I could navigate them in the dark. You take a flashlight. The deer come out in the evening, you know. Young people wouldn't survive. Nope. I could be an Adirondack guy. Don't want to. I don't want to take a tourist in the woods. They're too noisy. Now they got GPS. They're not going <laughs> to see anything. <laughs> Much less bugs. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, Adirondack guy. Yeah, yeah this is a book about, this great book about the Adirondacks. So I go back there. It's too hot and sticky. The climate is horrible. I didn't want to move here, ever. But these bees now in the shed, these are from Japan. Do you want to show me them? Yeah, I will. Wow. If you want to get up close. I will. Uh, wait a minute. Move. You can move some of this stuff out. It's got to come out anyway. Take this birdhouse out. Wow. They're coming in with pollen. Look at this. Yeah. See that? Look at the load of pollen. Look how fast they are, these yeah. honeybees. Yes, they this are. This is Anthophora. This is a fuzzy foot bee. Because they're so fuzzy. Oh, a raccoon. Yeah, they live under the shed. No. The cat does too. I don't particularly care to mess with raccoons, but they get so many They eat the cat food. Wow, but so what kind of bees you have here? Anthophora, Philippines from Japan. I brought them over to the USDA in 1989. I'll tell you what, let's move some of this junk out of here. 
You can take this cooler out. I will. So you can walk in there. I haven't had a chance to clean it. You see? So what do we got here? Well, you have Antarctica, Philippines, and you have Osmia Cornet. These are two Japanese bees that I brought over with permits. And uh, the Osmia Cornet is the mason bee. We have some native species, but this particular one they use in Japan for pollinating orchards. And they've been using it since the uh, 1940s. So I met the original farmer who started using it. But look at the big pollen load. Look at the one on this one coming. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. This one, this bee, the Antarctica bee, is even better. And I was the one who first started using it. The Japanese weren't even using it. It's a fairly common bee over there, but now they're starting to use it. Because I decided, look at this big, big load. Take a picture of that one. Yeah. She's about to land. You can get her. I they're gonna, fast though. They're very fast. That's why they're so good. I'm gonna need to come here with a different equipment for those. Yeah, you better. I wasn't prepared for that. Nobody is. I tell it you, these pollen bees are Beautiful. Great. Honeybees are made good for Look at the light on that pollen load. Yeah. You're gonna get a great picture. Do you have other equipment? Not here that's with me. Things. No, that's by far the best pollinator in the literature I've ever seen. I mean, people have studied them in the wild, but nobody's tried to manage them. They're really great. But people are starting, I'm starting to get some papers now, coming up now. People starting to try to use them. They work in greenhouses too. They'll pollinate, they buzz pollinate. So they'll work on tomatoes, for instance, in greenhouses. And they'll work on strawberries or bluebirds. They've been tested on those crops. Now look at that huge pollen on You have such a collection here. This is so beautiful. This is That's so beautiful. That's why I'm keeping them here. They're for safekeeping. And I want to be here every spring. That's why I came back. I was, they've already been going for a while. They'll end about the end of May. And then they're dormant the rest of the year. But let me show you the neatest thing. All right, we have more. I have Osmia corner from, but they, they got infested with a mite, which was brought over accidentally from on another bee. But look, this is Osmia corner friends and these. This is the first BS I started with. Well, some, they, there's some of them, but I don't have many anymore because they got infested with mites, which don't attack these. But let me show you something. In this box here, let me. this is the Antarctica bee. And this box has been in constant use since 1989. The same box? Same box. And absolutely no maintenance. Nice. So the farmer, if he has these and he has a little shed by his orchard, he won't have to do anything. With honeybees, you have to maintain the hive all the time. You know, got it? Yep. Oh, for the farmers. That's what I work for. This sounds a little... See, somebody else was taking care of them. They put things in front of the nest. And Beth, my good friend Beth, she's been sick or taking care of her family who's had sickness. So this year's been rough. Fortunately, I have a neighbor who was looking after my house. Dr. Matra, this is a beautiful thing. Isn't that gorgeous? Yes. Somebody there? I thought I heard something. Uh, yeah, it's due to Oh, there you are. I'm just cutting through. I got to do a yard inspection. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. They don't stick. I'm go. just showing him the bees. Here's the bees. Oh. Yeah, I know. I, I've been gone. I haven't been able to maintain it. I just got back. Well, we're doing it uh, different this year. What are you doing? They got me took it all around. I don't know if I'm going to do them all this year. What are you looking for? Here's the yard inspection. Oh, okay, but I've been gone, so I haven't been able to trim these things yet. I just got back a couple of days ago. Oh, okay then. Well, I like GHI anyway, so I like the yards. Especially now, the azaleas are great. The bees are great, too. Shh. It came just at the right time. Yep. Because they have so many regulations here. The last thing I need is somebody checking on my bees. It's time. 
Was it dormant most of the time? They didn't even here. Yeah. I mean, they, they finish by the end of May, and they won't start up again until next spring. This thing is shut up. Hmm. Closed up. It's only right now that it's open. There's some bees flying around. That's and they nice. They're not They don't sting. You can, you can go put your hand up there. Yeah, yeah. I know. Up in your hand. I was... They won't sting you. I've never been stung by them. And most of these pollen bees don't sting. I just come in and sit here and listen to them. They sound so nice. It's like a little chorus. It's a beautiful thing. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. I wish I... Yeah, you take these pictures and disseminate them. I will. They're called fuzzy foot bees. I, w I need to come here with the different equipment. Well, you're welcome anytime. And I will. But do it soon because they'll be finishing their life cycle pretty soon. And you're welcome to come any year. I mean, I plan to be not break my back or anything again. I'm learning to be more careful. I have to learn to be an old lady now. I've always been quite active. Oh, they're gorgeous. They start up um, in April. Have a nice day. Thank you. Sure. Well, they're the nest, huh? No, they're not honeybees. They don't sting. No, I mean the nest. All the things you made there. Yeah, that's what they are. These these are called fuzzy foot bees. They're for pollination. Huh. You can see the yellow things on their legs. Yeah. He's taking pictures of them. That's the pollen they bring in from the flowers. They're from, I work. I used to work for the Department of Agriculture at the farm here. So I'm, I specialty in bees and pollination. So these are some I just keep. They're only active right now in the spring. They do apple pollination. Hmm. Do you see the yellow? See the yellow on that one? Yeah. That's the pollen from the apples. It's coming home with the nest here. Mm -hmm. They won't sting you. Do they bite? No. Nope. Yeah. They're harmless. Hmm. They're not like honeybees. Oh, they don't okay. make honey either. But honeybees? Honey? No, oh. they're not honeybees. Well, these don't do. worry about them. They won't hurt you. They never stung me. These make honey. No. No. Honeybees make honey. Oh, okay. But these are pollen bees. Okay. Yeah, that's what we call them. Pollen bees. Because they collect pollen. Yeah. So they pollinate the apple trees. That's why we have apples. We gotta put pollen on the flowers. Ooh. Interesting. Yeah, they are interesting. Learn something new today. Yeah, yeah. They won't hurt anybody. Thank you. Yeah. See, a lot of education needed. Yep. That's a, what we do, it's right? It's a demonstration. That's what we do. We educate people about important things. Oh yeah, well, I've had demonstrations in schools and nature centers. And so here's some of the tubes that beautiful I Here, here's the tubes I use for awesome. I didn't know you have them here oh, uh, now why would they know now I'm gonna need to I, come I more equipped people. see here's the kind of tubes I use for this Take one that for sample those are osmium tubes I got them made special here the box full. these are empty I'm gonna come later okay and I keep this here okay. I'm gonna see. but if you want me to take some of these to mm -hmm. the, when I give my talk I can hand out some Tomorrow I'm gonna, to I will record everything and I'm gonna be prepared. Okay, well I'm glad the bees were flying so you can yes, see them. Yes, me too. And I'm you can see why I asked you to come and bring them, you know, take them for a demonstration at night. Yes. They're doing this all day and if you move them, just like honeybees, they get lost. Yeah. So I studied their behavior. Look at the load on this guy. Unfortunately, I have to go. Okay, well you go. Ah, uh, but I have to, I need to come back. Well, come back, you're welcome anytime. I leave the door open, you can just, you know, I leave it open this season when they're so busy, I leave the doors open. Yeah, but I, yeah. So but even if it's not, well, it will be open because it's a flying season. You come back when it's convenient. Yeah. Here's a dead deer, man. Here, put it in my yard. <laughs> Actually, do me a favor, you can take the deer out. Yes, I can. I can. Let me... Let Here, me I'll stop put it the next to my azalea bushes. Let me stop the recording. Okay. Let me yeah, take care of this for you. Yeah, I can go outside. A lot of stuff is from outside. I just put it in here for the winter. But it's still there. Here you can record me by the azalea bush. I keep all kinds of azaleas. For the bees, of course. Maybe you can see one on an azalea. Let me follow you.
Yeah, be careful, there's stones here. I haven't been able to prove anything yet. Just walk carefully. Too. I haven't. In the winter, I do a lot of yard work. I haven't had time to. This is. Well, I have many varieties of azaleas. They bloom at different times. This one was beautiful, pink one, but it's finished its bloom. Which one? Now. Those? No, this. But this is beautiful. That's a flame azalea. Yeah, these are the late azaleas. Yeah. Look and see if there's bees on them, but the bees are now going elsewhere. I don't know what's in bloom now. I mean, they could they have a flight range of two miles, so where they're going now. But Greenbelt's wonderful because everybody has different flowers. Don't you? How many years living here, taking care of these bees? Oh, well, we moved to this house in 1974. 74. I was minus one years old. <laughs> <laughs> minus one. <laughs> <laughs> Bet you were cute. <laughs> I like kids. You know, I, I especially like little kids. I don't like babies. I take too much trouble. But little kids, you know, school they're, age kids. They're fun. Grade school. Yeah, they're, they're so curious. Yes. So I like to play games for kids like... You go to a flower and you pick up a male bumblebee. So they buzz a lot and they show off a lot, but they don't have a stinger. Yeah. So I do that, things like that for kids, you know. I like to entertain kids, educate them about bees. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're so curious. Oh, this But their, their parents or the school teachers make them afraid of bugs. This place is... is it's jungle out here, isn't it? It is a... A jungle in a tiny backyard. You don't have to have a big bar. It's I don't gold. mow the grass, by the way. It's gold for me. I, I need to come back. Come back. Yeah. I will. It's a rainforest here, right? Yes, it is. Remind and me. And you know, all the neighbors mow their lawns. And mowing is stupid. Why do you Why do you want to grow grass? Remind me of home. Does it? Yep. Where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Oh, from Brazil? Yes. <laughs> How the killer bees doing down there? Uh, I grown up with them, so they were the normal to me for many, many years. Yeah, so you just don't bother them, right? Yeah, just when you know about them, you just That's right. deal with them. It'll take a long time for people to learn about yeah, them. Yeah, they got some stuff to learn, but they learn fast too. Of course, they're people. The, yeah, the bees. I respect all the bees. bees teach them very fast. Well, the reason the bees spread so fast is because they took care of themselves. Yeah, they're they, defensive. they know what they're doing. <laughs>